Hello and welcome to another video in which I build experiments from this book, uh, Make Electronics by Charles Platt. So from me in these videos, uh, no circuit schematics, no breadboard diagrams, you can find all that in the book if you want it, just me building experiments, seeing how I get on, showing you what results I get. So in a previous video we looked at these little guys, the humble switch. Uh, these are great of course, they allow a bit of human interaction with the circuit, uh, all well and good, but uh, that is a problem in itself. It does require human interaction. What if we want uh, something to switch on and off in the circuit without any human interaction? Well, then we introduce these, the relay. That's where these come in uh, because these can switch uh, part of a circuit uh, based on whether we apply current across a relay coil in the relay. Uh, so we can automate things. But the problem with these is they're electromechanical. And like all electromechanical devices, they're prone to failure over a period of time. And the other problem with them is they are slow. I mean, yeah, sure, when you've got them in an analog circuit, it seems to like work instantly. But you know, when we move on to from analog to digital electronics, we want things to go as fast as possible. These things are so, so slow. Um, in fact, you know, theoretically, you could build a computer out of relays. In fact, people have done, uh, and it's quite interesting to see, and I will post a link to a video so you can see how it's done. But those computers would be huge and power hungry and ponderously slow. So what happens when you want to switch things on and off, but really, really fast and without all the issues that come with an electromechanical device? Well, that is where these little chaps come in. And behind this mild, unassuming little package is one of the wonders of modern electronics, a solid state switch. So let's see how it works. OK, so this is the first transistor circuit. It's a very simple circuit. So here's our transistor. Um, this is a type of transistor uh, called an NPN uh, transistor. And with this type of transistor, you see there are three pins. Uh, the pin nearest to the top of the breadboard is a collector. The pin nearest to the bottom is an emitter. And the current flow that we're interested in is uh, the current flow from the collector to the emitter. That current flow is controlled by the third middle pin, which is the base. And with an NPN transistor, uh, when a positive voltage is applied to the base, then current is allowed to flow from the collector to the emitter. If there's no uh, positive voltage at the base, uh, then current will not be allowed to flow. So the way this circuit is wired up, we've got uh, two buttons. And the top button basically supplies power to the collector. And then from the emitter of the transistor, we uh, go through an LED, through a current limiting resistor, back to the negative side of the circuit. The bottom button connects the power supply to the base, but via a 100 kilo ohm resistor. So there will be very little current flow through that path. So if I activate that button now, uh, to supply power to the base, we do get a very tiny glow uh, on the LED. That's because there is a small amount of leakage current between the base and the emitter. But we're not particularly interested in that for this experiment. What you should be seeing is because I'm not supplying any power to the collector, we're not getting a, a large current flow across the uh, transistor. To do that, I would have to press this top button here, but nothing happens. The LED doesn't light up. And that's because at this point, there is no uh, current to the base. To allow the LED to turn on, because the transistor is turned on, I would have to press the second button uh, to supply power to the base. And that is what allows the current to flow from the collector to the emitter. As soon as I remove power to the base pin, then the transistor switches off and so does the LED. 
So I hope that you can see how this is similar to our circuit with the relay. So just as with the relay, to make the relay switch between the contacts, we had to supply power to the relay coil here to make the transistor switch on and off. We had to supply and remove power to the base pin. The other significant thing about this circuit is that uh, the supply to the base is coming through this 100k, 100 kilo ohm uh, resistor. So it's a very small uh, current flow because of the high value of that resistor. So effectively, what we've got going on here is that a very small current being applied to the base is actually controlling a larger current that is passing through the collector and the emitter. Uh, and again, a similar uh, property could be found in relays where you can have just a small current that is um, enough to activate the relay coil, but is controlling a large current that's going through uh, the switch uh, connectors. So the ability for a transistor to work as a switch is of course extremely useful in fact it's the basis for pretty much all of digital electronics but the other useful thing that a transistor can do is act as an amplifier and that's what we're going to test with this circuit so i've modified the circuit somewhat from what we had before so the first thing is i've just put a button in here to interrupt the power supply uh, just so that i can uh, depress that to apply power to the circuit when we're ready. Now from there we go to the collector of the transistor and then the circuit from the emitter side is pretty much the same as it was before so we're going through the LED through the currenting, current limiting resistor back to the negative rail. For the base I've substituted the 100k resistor that we had there before for a 33k um, but that is going via the meter so that we can measure the current flow to the base. So we're just going to uh, measure the current flow to the base and then try that with a couple of different values of resistors. So here we go with the 33K. So that is giving me 0 0.125 milliamps on the 33K. So let's now substitute the 33k resistor for the original 100k just pop that in there and in there okay and uh let me just reset the meter and let's see what we get with that Okay, so that's giving us 0 0.055 milliamps. And then once again, substitute that this time for a 330K resistor. So just pop that into place. Whoops. bit fiddly with a crowded breadboard there we go and let's see what we get with that that is giving us a measly 0 0.019 okay so I've made another small modification uh, first thing is I've gone back to the 33k resistor because we need to start again from that value um, I've just uh, put a direct supply to the base now, so I've removed the meter from there. But instead, I've inserted the meter in series with the collector so that this time we can measure current to the collector. So let's start and see what we get with the 33K resistor. Okay, that's giving me... If we just let that settle down... 23, it seems to want to keep climbing, but I'm just going to call it 23.5 for the sake of argument. 
Um, okay, let's substitute that 33K for the 100K again. See what we get there. Oop. That would help if I click connected it, the resistor to the right thing. There we go. So there we've got 10.5 milliamps. And again, it wants to just creep up, but we'll keep it at 10.5. Uh, and then finally, again, with the 330K, so pop that in to the base. And let's see what that gives us. Oh, I've made exactly the same error. <laughs> Obviously, don't learn from my mistakes. There we go. That is giving us 3.6. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is uh, just do a quick calculation to see what amplification factor we've got for each of those three tests. So if you can read my scroll, uh, this is what we got. Um, so the amplification factor for the 33 was 188, it was 190.1 for the 100k, and it was 189.5 for the 330k. And given how close those figures are to each other, that does indicate a very linear uh, response in terms of amplification. Okay, this, is, uh, this experiment is a continuation of the previous one. Um, again, the circuit has been much simplified. Uh, so basically, we've got a direct uh, connection from the power supply to the collector. The emitter side of the circuit is unchanged, again, running through the LED, the current limiting resistor, back to the negative rail. There's no light at the moment because uh, I don't know how easily you can see on the video, but I've put two uh, wires that don't join uh, to the base. So at the moment, there's zero current flowing to the base of the transistor. Um, and actually, I can now use my finger um, to bridge that gap. And you will see that the LED comes on when I do. Uh, but actually, because of that amplification factor, if I touch very lightly, then obviously, there's a higher resistance, so not much current flows. Uh, but if I press down harder, and you can see, oops, helps if I don't push the uh, wire completely out of the way. But as I push down harder, you see that uh, LED glows brighter uh, because the current through my the tip of my finger is increasing, and that's being amplified uh, by the current flowing from the collector to the emitter. Okay, it's time to uh, combine some of the principles that we've been looking at in a single circuit. So what's going on in this circuit? Well, up here we have um, an LED, and that is connected to the normally open uh, connection on a relay. Uh, and then, of course, it has a current limiting resistor. So um, this LED is not going to light until um, the relay coil is energized. So uh, down here we have our transistor um, and the emitter current uh, is what will activate the relay, is what will energize the relay coil. But of course, in order to that, for that to flow, there needs to be a base current. Um, so the base current is applied by turning on this uh, little switch here. However, you'll notice that um, the base is connected to a resistor capacitor pair. Uh, and from what we've seen in previous episodes, 
uh, that will cause uh, a bit of a time delay as the capacitor uh, charges up. And the rate at which the capacitor charges up will be dictated by this resistor here, which in this case is 1K. So what we should see when I put the switch on is that the LED won't light instantly. There will be a short delay uh, and then it will light up. So let's see if that works. Let me just uh, put this down a bit so that you can see the LED. Uh, now I'm going to uh, hold on to this switch uh, and actually push it with the tip of a pen because my experience with these little miniature switches is if you try and do it with your finger, you just end up pulling them out of the breadboard. Okay, so here we go. So watch the LED uh, and watch for the delay. There you go. So, and you may have heard the click as the relay coil energized there. Um, so obviously there was a very short delay. Uh, if I turn that back off, it will go off. Let's see it again. Turn the switch on. About a second delay and then the LED comes on. Now, of course, that time is pretty much dictated by um, the value of this resistor. Um, and if we had a higher value resistor to reduce the flow of current into the capacitor, then that would slow the rate of the capacitor charging and we would get a longer delay. Um, it would be nice, wouldn't it, if um, uh, there was a way of controlling uh, that delay. And in fact, there is. And that's what I'll show you in the next circuit. So uh, we've now added one of these things to the circuit. Uh, you can see it's uh, got got three pins. Uh, this is a, a variable resistor or potentiometer. Um, and this one is in a miniature configuration uh, that is designed to be operated with a precision screwdriver. So you can just pop a screwdriver into the slot in the top to adjust it. So these ones are really designed for setting values that you might, uh, for example, set once and then forget about uh, maybe to configure a circuit. Um, so here it is on the uh, breadboard. And I've actually set it to its minimum value. So if I activate the switch now, you're not going to see a huge amount of difference in the delay. So there we go. We had a delay of about a second, maybe slightly less, and then the uh, LED came on. But what I can do now is adjust this. Uh, these are also known as trim pots, by the way. Um, so you can, uh, because you use them to trim uh, a circuit. So I can just turn it a little way round, and that uh, now should give us a longer delay. Let's see if that's worked. Yep, so as you saw, uh, we had several seconds more um, in that position. Let me turn it uh, right up to the max and see how long we get. This might be a long wait. So about 15 seconds, I reckon, uh, by a very approximate count. So there you can see uh, that's a fairly considerable range from one second delay to 15 seconds delay just by adjusting that one uh, trim pot. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that and you found it at least a little bit interesting. And as per always, you can find the circuits, you can build the projects for yourself, you buy a copy of the book. You know, transistors are so important. They're the basis for so many things that we just take for granted now. Uh, and you'll see them again in future projects, starting with the next episode, where finally we get to build a circuit that actually does something other than give us interesting meter readings or pretty patterns on an oscilloscope. So join me for that. It'll be a light and sound extravaganza. All right, I might be exaggerating a little there, but you'll only find out if you join me for the next episode. See you then.